By about 4.5 billion years ago, a rocky planet had accreted from the matter circling the young sun. Its surface would have started off as molten rock, and most of the water drawn in with the original accretion would have stayed in the atmosphere until things cooled down enough to allow the water to condense and then remain in liquid form. We probably didn't even get much of a solid crust until around 4 billion years ago. Between water that was there from the beginning and perhaps the capture of more water from comets during the bombardment phase, the Earth's oceans eventually formed. Continual impacts of the late heavy bombardment continue until around 3.8 billion years ago. Bottom line is that the Hadean Earth was an entirely unfriendly place for life, and yet very early in the Archean, no later than 3.5 billion years ago, there was life. On a part of the crust now occupied by Australia, prokaryotic life that formed bacterial mats got preserved as stromatolites, and somehow these never got destroyed over the time since with the turnover of crust caused by the movement of plates. Most of the Earth's crust has been recycled many times as a result of subduction, where two plates pushing against each other results in one diving below the other and melting in the Earth's mantle. We are lucky to have such places as Australia that are tectonic dead zones, not much geologically happening there for the entire history of the Earth. There are some other places besides Oz, notably bits of Greenland and South Africa, where parts of the crust is very close to the original stuff that solidified from the molten surface days of the Hadean. The fact that some of these ancient rocks bear signs of life is really pretty amazing. But if cellular life was there 3.5 billion years ago, where did it come from? Or rather, what natural processes gave rise to cellular life originally, that is, abiotically? Both Campbell and I like to take the approach of breaking things down into discrete steps, each one having its own plausible mechanism that would have taken place to some degree in the early Earth. Here is Campbell's sequence. In my lectures, I like to reverse three and four, putting the evolution of autocatalysis, that is, catalyzing one's own synthesis, ahead of the membrane step. But the beauty of having distinct steps is that you don't have to be tied to a single narrative. There may be several different mechanisms by which a step can be achieved, and you might even be able to shuffle the sequence around some. It's unlikely that we'll ever have a definitive history for the origin of cellular life, but it's reasonable to think that if all four of these steps were somehow achieved, the result would be a cell capable of growing, dividing, that is, reproducing, and evolving. You can take your basic understanding of a cell and dissect it conceptually to answer the question of what it is that's required to qualify as a legitimate cell. A membrane would be needed to define what's inside the cell and what's not. And this membrane would also be really important for concentrating the raw materials and reactants inside a confined volume, allowing chemical reactions to take place at a reasonably fast rate. Besides the membrane, you would need a set of molecules that, given raw materials available from the outside world, would be capable of catalyzing the synthesis of every single molecule in the set, plus the molecules comprising the membrane. So you've got a self-catalyzing, that is, autocatalytic set of molecules encased in a membrane of some sort. And after a while, all that catalysis would result in there being more of everything. Enough for this entity to split into two more or less equivalent halves. And this is basically binary fission, or cell division. And the whole unit undergoing the fission would be the cell. Now, I'm going to reiterate a term that isn't in your textbook the autocatalytic set, and by this I mean the collection of self-catalyzing molecules which is at the core of this cellular origin story. What is required for the formation of such an autocatalytic set? Well, if you look at modern cells, the molecular players in the autocatalytic sets of all cells, ranging from the simplest bacteria to the most elaborate eukaryote, are mostly proteins and nucleic acids, and this is why we require step two. You can't make an autocatalytic set without these molecules. Actually, it is theoretically possible to have an autocatalysis evolve with molecules other than what exist in the known world. 
and maybe some kind of non-protein, non-nucleic acid system of autocatalysis was what gave rise originally to cellular life. And the proteins and nucleic acids that we see today evolved later and replaced whatever was there before. Now we can't exclude this idea, but it's incredibly hard to speculate about systems of biochemistry that were possible under the Earth's conditions, and then how they could have later been supplanted by the familiar systems. For our purposes here, we'll focus on narratives involving the familiar players of proteins and nucleic acids. But we've gotten ahead of ourselves here. Before we can talk about the origin of autocatalysis, we have to first account for the abiotic synthesis of macromolecules like proteins and nucleic acids. And in order to do this, we need to have some mechanism for the generation of organic small molecules like amino acids and nucleotides that would be necessary as the building blocks for proteins and nucleic acids. These are steps one and two in both Campbell's as well as my speculative walkthroughs for the abiotic origin of cellular life. As shown by the Haldane, Oprin, Urey, and Miller experiments described in any general biology textbook, it's relatively easy to demonstrate the synthesis of small organic molecules under conditions that would have been present in the early Earth. This is step one. Once you have these organic building blocks, it's also relatively easy to account for the polymerization step, a completely random polymerization of these small organics to generate larger molecules that would at least resemble the functional polypeptides and polynucleotides we know today. This is step two. I'll defer to the textbook, and maybe for some of you, your next writing assignment to have you identifying a plausible mechanism both for the synthesis of the amino acids, which would be step one, and for the polymerization of the polypeptide, step two. For me, the most interesting part of the story is speculation on how randomly generated macromolecules could have acquired the properties of self-replication in an autocatalytic set. I'll spend the remainder of this lecture on the evolution of autocatalysis keeping in mind that this is really the crucial step and also conceptually the most challenging one when it comes to understanding the origin of cells and life. We have to start with the presumption that steps one and two are complete. Through some naturalistic mechanism, we've generated random polymers of both amino acids and nucleotides, making short polypeptides and polynucleotides. Once made, these molecules basically sit around and do nothing. There's no organic decomposer community, and with effectively no oxygen, O2, to cause the chemical oxidation and degradation of these organic polymers, they'll last a long time once they're formed. One thing we know about polypeptides, and some polynucleotides like RNA, is that they naturally fold on themselves to make specific shapes. And it's conceivable that some of these shapes are able to bind specifically to organic structures, resulting in some degree of catalysis. Now you have to picture what I'm saying here. It's really kind of weird. It's that if you make enough random polypeptides, you're bound to create some catalytic surfaces purely by accident. Maybe it's one in a hundred of these random shapes that's capable of catalyzing something, and you don't know what the reaction is. It's being catalyzed, and you can be sure that it's not very good at catalyzing that reaction, but it does better than no catalyst at all. And maybe it's one out of a thousand or one out of ten. We just, there's no way for saying. The only thing we can say with fair certainty is that a polypeptide with a given amino acid sequence will take a specific shape. We can't tell what kind of reaction that shape might be catalytic for, especially considering that the presumed catalytic activity at this stage would be thousands of times weaker than what we're used to with highly derived protein enzymes. Yet this is our conceptual starting point. An organic soup containing a large diversity of random polymers, some of which have the ability to catalyze something completely by accident. In the first model, we focus on RNA, ribonucleic acid, and its ability to do two crucial things. Like polypeptides, it's able to fold and to create catalytic notches and grooves. And being a nucleic acid, it's also able to serve as a template for its own synthesis because of complementary base pairing. Now, what if the random catalysis carried out by a particular RNA molecule turned out to be the polymerization of ribonucleotides? Hypothetically, a molecule capable of catalyzing its own kind would make more copies of itself, while all the rest of the polymers, again, are sitting around and doing nothing. Come back in a few years, 
and you'd find an abundance of the self-replicating RNA molecule, while all the other molecules would be unique, one-of-a-kind creations, because they formed completely at random, and there's no process in existence that would make more of them. Come back in a few more years, and the place would be overrun with self-replicating RNA. Maybe with some variants, you know, because mistakes happen. And if a variant occurs that results in faster or more accurate replication, it would have an advantage over the original replicator and would soon come to dominate. This is natural selection, only instead of organisms, we're looking at self-replicating molecules that evolve over time, becoming better and better at self-replication. The evolution of more complex systems of self-replication from single molecular replicators might occur through a process known as hypercycle, as envisioned by Manfred Eigen. In hypercycle, these molecular self-replicators team up. Replicator A starts to focus not on itself, but on the synthesis of molecule B. B, in turn, starts to catalyze the synthesis of C and so on, until you end up with the last molecule in the sequence catalyzing the replication of A. This closed loop of catalysts might actually be faster at increasing the total amount of molecules in the system, and this would put the team of replicators at a significant advantage relative to the replicators operating solo. Also, the evolution of these individual replicators could proceed with the molecules becoming more and more specialized for their specific task, and eventually they could lose the capacity to self-catalyze. The end result is the evolution of a complex autocatalytic set that's ready to be incorporated into a membrane and thereby becoming the first cell. Now a second mechanism for doing the same thing for seeing the origin of the complex autocatalytic set comes to us from the field of complexity theory. And the exciting twist here is the way that the complex system actually crystallizes spontaneously under the right conditions. Now remember how earlier I would said that the non-replicating molecules in the soup would not increase because there's no catalyst for the replication? Well that's not really the case because if there's a large enough diversity in the soup then just by chance there's some possibility for any given molecule to have some catalyst out there able to make more of it. You know, molecule X. It could be the catalyst for the synthesis of molecule Y. And it could presumably be the case that molecule Y is a catalyst for some other molecule Z that's out there. Now conceptually, you should be able to picture the existence of a closed loop of an autocatalytic set that doesn't have to start out as a bunch of self-replicators. You know, remember the, uh, in hypercycle, you start off as self-replicators that begin to do this daisy chain thing where they start specializing in the, the replication of a different molecule as opposed to themselves. In the case of the model we're talking about here, we're not really starting off as self-replicators. Now, how likely is it for such a thing to happen? And here's where complexity theory comes in. Stuart Kaufman of the Santa Fe Institute demonstrates that the likelihood of such an autocatalytic set depends on two things, the diversity of molecules in the randomly generated array of polymers, as well as the degree of interconnectivity between the random catalysts and the molecules that they catalyze. In other words, getting back to that question of how likely is it for a polypeptide to take a random shape that's a catalyst for another molecule that's out there someplace. This is their interconnectivity. What's the likelihood of a molecule being a catalyst for some other molecule in the set? And if this catalytic interconnectivity is very low, there's practically no chance for there to be an autocatalytic set. If the interconnectivity is too high, the system actually behaves chaotically, and a successful loop of self-contained autocatalysis can't be isolated. But if the interconnectivity is just below the level of chaos, right at the boundary between nothing happening and chaotic behavior, autocatalytic sets emerge as successful systems of self-replication. This proposed mechanism of self-organized complexity is special, really because it's special because it's the only conceivable explanation for the generation of biological complexity without resorting either to natural selection, which we're familiar with, it's a naturalistic force, or to some kind of supernatural creative force, and that would be non-scientific. 
Now I realize that may have been a little bit heavy, but I wanted to show you this beautiful example of truly outside the box thinking that has the potential for changing the landscape of our understanding of the natural world. The bottom line here though, and getting back to the issue of abiogenesis, is that through one constellation or another of the successful fulfillment of steps one through four, there emerged the very first living cell, which was the ancestor to all of life. Now the way we draw out trees in Bio 202, there's a single cellular ancestor to all of life. Now comes a question, could there have been multiple independent origins for cellular life? Well, the answer is possibly yes, it's conceivable. But all known forms of cellular life, everything that we've seen so far in the world, they share a boatload of structural and molecular commonalities. And this points strongly towards a single origin. If there have been multiple origins of life over the Earth's history, only one is known to persist today. And given the presence of bacterial mats dating to almost 3.5 billion years ago, and presuming that the cells in those mats also derive from that first cell, this means that the events leading to the abiogenic origin of cellular life would have predated 3.5 billion years ago. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, there is some evidence for biogenic chemical signatures from as early as 4.1 million years, but the validity of such evidence is a little bit questionable, and the date here is really less important to us than the fundamental knowledge that cellular life has been on Earth in the very earliest times in the Earth's history, no later than the earliest part of the Archean.